Hello, I am Reverend Irene Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to Generationally Speaking. Here at the table, we come and we discuss life issues, no matter what they might be. As we sit at the table with each generation, we all learn, we all grow, we all are inspired. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Generationally speaking. I never had the opportunity to meet Dr. King person. He was assassinated on the night of my senior class trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, he was in uh, Tennessee, and um, that was one of the other dreams. But I've been among black royalty in this, in this city. And what we have to do is... But you were tapped. Yeah, I was tapped. I mean, and, 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 but the young people had to understand the reason why I was tapped was that they saw my commitment early. Okay. They saw my commitment to volunteer. They saw my uh, body of work trying to move my colleagues to get us engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of how the civil rights movement, they tap leaders like John was part of SNCC, him and uh, the late Ben Brown and the late Julian Bond and, and Lenny King, all of them started SNCC. And, de and uh, Dr. King brought them in. Right. And the Freedom Riders were mainly students from HBCUs and other college campuses. And so when they brought me in, I delivered. And, and, and I still I tell folks I'm a servant leader. Mm -hmm. The first um, term. I, I was elected 10 years as a one, chair of 100 Black Men of America. And people couldn't believe as chairman, I'd be in the room with my staff and volunteers helping to unpack boxes and helping to kind of mm -hmm. do the, do help them do the work. Because I said, you know, in order to lead, you also got to be a follower. Right. And you have to lead by example. Mm -hmm. And still to this day, they'll tell you, you talk to my staff or you talk to any of my members, they'll tell you, I'm a work horse, not a show horse. And that was my theme when I first ran and every time I use it. Um, all of that's part of, of being a leader. I'm, I don't sit on a throne. Right. Right. And you, know, you look at Dr. King, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, he's the second African-American Nobel Peace Prize winner he gave away all of his money. He lived in a modest home on Sunset. It was Oprah who moved Mrs. King from that home because they had a break in to a beautiful condominium that she bought wow. from Mrs. King. Wow. Um, but but through all of that, I've learned that um, a real leader doesn't seek followers, as Dr. Miles Monroe, Monroe said, mm -hmm. they inspire them. You have to be an inspirational leader. And that's what I've tried to do because the people who I work with and people who work with me and who may be followers know that I'm not going to ask them to do anything that I won't do the same or more. And I think that perhaps that answers my next question is with all the success that, that God has blessed you to have. And I, and I think that's just wonderful. How have you managed to stay grounded and how have you been able to make sure that you balance family life, work life, and your children? I talked to another uh, entrepreneur, and he talked about how he had suffered because yeah. he didn't have he didn't balance himself, and right. he lost family because of that. So, how have you been able to ground yourself, keep yourself grounded in the midst of being in the, <laughs> all, amongst all these giants, well, you know, and, and and such great success? Well, first. They helped because when they walked down the streets. They didn't have drivers or anything. Mm -hmm. People stopped them. And, and I've followed from their, in their footsteps. Um, it's tough, a tough balancing piece because, you know, my wife and I, when I, after I did the 10 years and said, okay, that's it, all these guys kept calling and trying to get me to run again. And they called her and, and, um, I remember one day we were sitting down talking and she said, OK, I've gotten enough calls. They asked me to convince you to run. She said, I know you want to run. She said, I'll support anything you decide to do. Uh, the one thing I regretted, 
from um, the early years, my youngest son uh, was growing up right in the midst of uh, my, really the revolution of the 100. Right. And it was very demanding. He and I spent time, but not as much as I wanted to. I looked around and he was grown. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was in high school and moving. But what inspired me when he was in middle school, he was told me, he said, Dad, I'm going to organize, organize the 100 black boys. <laughs> But he grew up in the 100. He's mm -hmm. now on the executive board for the Atlanta branch. He's elected to the board. I, I guess the one thing I missed then, but I'm, I'm, you'll never catch up. But I've been able to spend uh, much more time with him, with him and all of my children. My grandchildren loved them to death. You know, COVID came along and disrupted some things. That's the biggest thing that I think the biggest impact on me has not been able to hug them and mm -hmm. see them on a regular basis because they I, I come from a hugging family and my kids and my son's his his son um actually moved in with us um because his mother was fine they were all fine when coming over and so we had a guest room for all the children when they were there they had their own bedroom bedroom for the boys bedroom for the girls grandchildren and i came home one day from work he had moved downstairs <clears throat> to the bedroom, had his whole little apartment down below. <laughs> but he loved it. That that I've missed not being able to see him every day. Mm -hmm. But we talk. Or he'll come in with his mask. I'll hug. A lot of times I just meet him in the outside, but I miss that. Right. But that was a balancing act back then. Mm -hmm. And But they understood. I was giving a lot of time and effort to help young black boys and girls who were in challenged society who were in at-risk communities. And I say young children aren't at risk. The, their, their communities are. And we have to work for those communities and work with young people. So with that, they, um, they understood what I was trying to do. Uh, but it took a lot of time. And then the, the other thing that doing all of that, uh, I was hit with one of the deadliest cancers wow. ever documented. Wow. Adenocarcinoma, the small intestine. Mm. Uh, it has 92% mortality rate. I was in 8% and I beat it. Eight percentile. And, you know, the thing that helped me was when I was sitting in my little hotel room called the hospital, I went through surgery. I went through chemo. I lost, um, wow, I wa lost almost 80 pounds. And... The one thing was all these little notes from the kids, yeah. young people who wrote me, funny, all these misspelled letters. It was encouraging. Mm -hmm. I got all of these flowers. The hospital had to turn my phone off while I was getting so many calls. Um, and and the, But the one thing through all of that, I remember the, the, the chaplain came into my room after I had, had surgery. And he said, Mr. Dorch, are you angry with God? Mm -hmm. And I said, excuse me, you said, am I angry with God? I said, God gave me 35 wonderful years. Why would I be angry with God? I sing God's praises for allowing me those 35 years and to be able to have done the things I've done. He said, well, I see you don't need me. Uh, he said, you're in touch. I said, right. The thing that I said before, after my doctors finished and they'd done their job, it was between me and my maker. Right. And but the encouraging thing was, was all of the calls, all of the cards from the kids. And I remember one event Maynard Jackson organized over at the uh, it was a Holiday Inn at the time on uh, Capitol Avenue. Had a lot of my friends and everybody there and Sam Nunn, all of them came. And he said, we want to give you your roses while you're here yeah. with us. And all of the love that was they are, that helped me heal, I think, more than anything. But the, what it said to me is God spared me. Yes. And to be in that 8 percentile who survived, mm -hmm. I am going to, until the day I die, I'm going to give back. And that, that another one of my good friends who, who died, I mentioned Dr. Miles Monroe. He said, we have to die empty. He said, the most yes. valuable graveyard, yes. the most valuable real estate in this world. Ooh. 
are the graveyards where people have gone yes. to their graves with so much talent, skill, and knowledge, yes. and they don't share. Yes. He said, we have to die empty. Mm -hmm. And so every day I get up, I empty my life into yes. somebody or something for the betterment of other people. And speaking of that emptying your life, I mean, what was it? Was it driving the streets of Atlanta, going on the college campuses, you know, passing by these carryouts? What was it that made you decide, I want to divest my time, my energy into this 100 black men? Well, I'm a charter member of the 100 black men of Atlanta. And we, as I mentioned earlier, eight of us formed the national organization. When I sat down, uh, Nate Golston and all of them, the late uh, Jim Davis, they called us and assembled about 35 of us. And they talked about the 100 and what was going on and they wanted to bring a chapter here. And there's conversation about really advancing this organization. And we talked and the men in the room were friends, people who had done a lot of things, movers and shakers, whether it was in education, business or whatever, um, and our elected officials. And so we agreed we'd form 100 Black Men of Atlanta. And as part of that, uh, we joined nine other chapters and said, let's go ahead and, and, and form a national. We did that formal charter of the national organization here. Mac Hunter wrote up the paperwork and Mac had to be out of town on a trial the day we were going to file. So Bill Campbell filed the papers um, to charter the 100 of Atlanta and the 100 of America. Mm -hmm. uh, he did, the, Bill did the 100 of America, Mac did the 100 of Atlanta. And, and so, but yeah, Mac did all the paperwork. But the thing that really hit home we decided, well, let's adopt a class and we'll work with them and we'll guarantee those young folks, you graduate from high school, we'll pay for your education, go wow. to any college wow. you want to go to. Well, we were looking around at schools and it just happened on this particular day. Um, the late Maynard Jackson, the late John Lewis, Michael Lomax, who was the chair of the county commission, um, trying to remember who else. Oh, our chief of police, Elgin Bell. They were going to go spend the night in Perry Homes. Perry Homes was the most crime infested public housing neighborhood in our city. And they went over there, did a press conference. They were in and around midnight, um, gunfire broke out <laughs> and they rushed them all out of Perry <laughs> Homes. And in our meeting, we said, that's where we're going. Mm. And we picked Archer High School. Now, Archer High School in the heyday was where Gladys Knight graduated from and several others. So we went there, worked with the uh, principal, African-American principal, and we met with the eighth grade class with the parents and students, and we signed a covenant with them. Agreed, you, you go to, you graduate, we'll pay everything, and the parents agreed to make sure they went to school. Well, we found out they needed much more than just a promise. Mm -hmm. A lot of them needed um, instrumental, um, extra uh, classroom uh, intervention and everything. So we created a Saturday mm -hmm. Academy. As part of the contract, these young folks had to show up for that academy every Saturday. We paid them a stipend. We said, we don't want to hear you talk about, I got to go flip burgers or none of this <laughs> stuff. This is your job, your education. At the time, only 43% of an eighth grade class graduated. We worked with them in addition to adopting that class. We worked all throughout the school. <coughs> we were very visible in the school. And so the grade level of the whole school went up. Wow, wow. And our class, we graduated 96% wow. of all the students who started in eighth grade graduated. Um, Three young ladies got, I mean, two young ladies got pregnant. One young man ended up going to, to um, going to prison. One dropped out. We got the two young ladies back in, got them to graduate, got the young brother who dropped out. Wow. We only lost one student. Wow. And so when it came time for them to go, we realized that we made this big promise. We worked to get them through. Right. 
And so two years before, we said, either we're all going to have to fork over and pay for this individually. <laughs> so we created, first it was called the Ebony Classic, and later became the Atlanta Football Classic. It was one of the most successful bowls for HBCUs. Okay. We brought Tennessee State and, um, and Florida and M University in to play it. We paid the largest purse of any classic for any black college, but we had great success and um, had corporate partners to work with us. So we made the money to pay for their tuition. In addition to that, we all made a commitment to pitch in and pay okay. to solidify that. Um, we had students that went all over the place. There was one young lady I write about in my book, I think I may have one of them here, was Sonia Jelks. Sonia, we interviewed every student. Sonia said, she, and there were several great students came out. Sonia said she wanted to be an executive secretary. The one thing we do in mentoring is never tell a student they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, if you want to be an executive secretary, you got to do X, Y, and Z. We talked to her about reading being important, writing, all of those things. Sonia um, and all of them graduated. Sonia ended up going to Syracuse University. Wow. We paid a full ride. She graduated with honors. Mm -hmm. She came back. Um, she had a 3.7 GPA. She came back and said, I know you promised to take your undergraduate. Can you help me with graduate school? I want to go to graduate school. He said, sure. We paid full ride. She graduated with honors from there. Wow. Sonia Jelks is now a city council person in Connecticut. She, uh, as an elected official, she got a PhD. She worked for a Fortune 100 and 500 company. A young lady who only wanted to be right. an executive secretary. And what we say is we have to help young people dream their dreams and right. make their dreams right. a reality. I had a six, seven uh, young man in Charlotte said he wanted to be a concert pianist. The first mentor they gave kept trying to get him into sports. He didn't want to play sports. And so they changed the mentor. The mentor said, gave him a six, nine mentor. And he said, whatever you want to be, we're going to work to get you there. Mm -hmm. He ended up going to Juilliard. Um, but they thought he should be in football. He's a concert uh, violin, I mean, a uh, pianist. But it's my book called <coughs> Miracles of Mentoring is that miracles really right. do happen. Right, right. It, it's, it's not, miracles don't have to be something that's bigger than a mountain. It's little miracles at a time, I think, and little steps at a time. And so going in, that the 100 has been about all of our chapters have mentoring. You can't be a chapter without a mentoring right. program. But what has inspired me was what we were able to do with the young people at Archer, mm -hmm. what we did in communities, mm -hmm. the support we gave to multiple schools, not just Archer High School, looking at young people who grow up to be boys to men right. and young ladies, little girls, the women. Uh, we've had programs called uh, Young Men Behaving Responsibly mm -hmm. because everybody looks down on the young lady when she becomes pregnant. We said we have to work, but it, it, it's two people. It takes two to tangle. <laughs> and, and my whole philosophy I've always been boys can make babies. It's men who raise them. Right. And so Young Men Behaving Responsibly was a mentoring program of young men to young men mm -hmm. talking about what they have to do. We... we um, were the first African-American organization that was funded through the Office of um, Population Affairs. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working, dealing with that issue. We um, right now are launching a, a violence prevention program because um, with all of this violence going on now, um, we, we, we did it in 95 and now we're starting a billboard campaign. And what I'm doing is having young people design the um, posters for billboards and all. Awesome. We have high school and middle school who are designing posters and designing a social media campaign wow. that we're going to put all that out. Great. And, great. and because I told them, but we're going to deal with violence and all. It's like going to the doctor and saying, treat me. You don't ask. Them. And the doctor doesn't know what your symptoms mm -hmm. are. We know poverty is the root cause of a lot of what we see in crime mm -hmm. and what we're seeing out here. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to solve all of that without dealing with, with poverty. 
You're not going to sign, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to change all of that without dealing with improving our educational system. Some schools are great, some are okay. Uh, but if we look back in history, what hurt us and where ghettos and all got created, black people, instead of young people growing up and having all of the diversity and seeing mm -hmm. people who made it, having different folks who have different capacities, not being integrated in that classroom, it hurt our system. And the white schools only wanted to take the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my senior year when I graduated high school, um, my team scrimmaged the white team behind closed doors. Um, they had a young coach. He wanted to play us because yeah. our reputation was stellar. We beat them 167 to 49. <laughs> The fourth quarter, our whole bench played. That team went on that year and won the state championship, that white team. Because? They won it because we gave them some competition. Exactly. But the next year, they only lost two players. One was a starter. The next year, three of my um, classmates, two of them were juniors who turned seniors were starters and one senior was starters. They kept, because the tallest guy on my team was 6'3". That was a center. I'm 6'1 as a forward. They had a seven-footer. So, you know, they kept the seven-footer. They won two more state championships. And then they did the same with football, because that's what a lot of these schools, they want the cream of the crop mm -hmm. for sports and, and and all. So what what is important now is building our community, working to make sure our schools, we work in every city where we have a chapter, we're in schools in that city. My South Metro chapter has 13 schools. Right. They work in the South Metro side. Um, but what, what I saw then, and I kind of grew up that with my parents, because there was a guy named Billy Latner. Mm -hmm. Billy was a handyman for my dad. Mm -hmm. Worked hard, but on weekends he drowned his miseries. Yes. Yes. And um, I remember my dad told Billy to take me down because when you were 16, when you turned 16, you could go for you, you could get your driver's license or they would renew what was called the learner's license. Mm -hmm. So dad told Billy to take me down to get my learner's license renewed. But my dad didn't know was Billy was letting me drive down Curry <laughs> Mountain where he had a restaurant. I drive down at night down those wide winding roads and Billy said, he said, with your rusty ass, if you don't go down here and take the driver's exam, I'm going to make you walk all the way back. And you know, we had to go back there, yeah. all the way across town to yeah. white community. I went down there, I knocked that exam out <laughs> and got my driver's license. And he was just smiling. He was so, hey, he said, now when you go back, you tell Tom you want a car. I told my dad, my dad gave me a car. All right. Yeah. But it was Billy who knew my talent, knew my experience who saw that in me. His daughter, he had two daughters. One is a medical doctor and the other is a lawyer mm -hmm. because he didn't cut corners on education. Mm -hmm. And and so that's for me, when I see people down in their luck, you don't know what they've been through. And when I go into a hotel, the doorman, I spend time with them. When I'm in the lobby, the bellman, because they're just as important as anybody else. That's the one thing I tell people you know, even with my the people who work in sanitation, I give them Christmas gifts and everything because there are mornings I may be slow getting my trash out. They'll knock on my door mm -hmm. and say, hey, buddy, you forgot to put your trash out. And I take it out. But without them, just imagine the pain right. our communities would right. be in without sanitation workers, right. without, without folks who do work in restaurants. I mean, those have been the people on the front line, too. Exactly. And so... My value system from my mother and my father and all, all has stayed with me. Then having like minds. And I don't do clubbing. I didn't, uh, right. even when I left college, I used all my time trying to do something for mm -hmm. somebody. Mm -hmm. And even in our businesses, we own six businesses, about one third of everything we earn, we give, we give away. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm blessed to be here. Right. Right. And so... The legacy I want to leave is for my children and grandchildren, for all the children I work with, is that he was committed to us. Mm -hmm. 
I am not trying to be some black guy hanging out with white folks and rich folks and all of that. I got my own money and I'm using my money for good. Mm -hmm. I don't need validation by going to all that stuff that they do. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, and I tell my business partners and friends, if you can't reinvest in our people, then, you know, we'll do the business. You go your way, I'm going mine. But we're where we are because we were blessed. Right. God didn't make us what we are. We didn't get to be successful because we're the best and the baddest. Because right. I know a lot of people who are much smarter than me and others who never get that break. Right. And so all of that said, um, my legacy and everything that I, I'm trying to do is based on me following the pathway from my father, from what the great civil rights leaders have done, looking at all these young folks, one of the most inspiring things was to see young people in the elections last year and in the runoff kind of reminded me how we used to do it in college. And they wanted to give credit to, to Stacy, and Stacy did a good job, but we had one of the biggest and best coalitions in the states. The, the uh, Divine Nine came together, NAACP, SCLC, Concerned Black Clergy, Student Government Associations, Young Student Leaders. And when we were having demonstrations here and in many places in the country, those young people were registering right. people to vote. Right. And so for me, I think we got a bright future. And with all of this voter suppression stuff, as I tell folks, we don't have time to complain they came with their game plan. We developed our own game plan to beat what they're trying to do. Well, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out and for giving me, uh, and uh, generationally speaking, an opportunity just to come and chat with you. I recognize and realize you didn't have to, uh, but I'm just thankful that you you know, decide to give us this opportunity. I want to congratulate you for being a part of History Makers. Oh, that's been uh, that is piece. awesome for those who don't know what History Makers uh, is. It's a 501c3 organization that chronicles the life of uh, and legacy of our, hi our historians, our civil rights persons, known and less known. Right. And so those they, they're capturing. Those, those stories so they can be told later. And also, I understand that you're uh, a part of uh, the Wax the and the yeah, Wax. Great, great Blacks and great Wax blacks in Baltimore. Blacks in, that was in a great Baltimore, one. you're that was part a great of that. Right. And so, um, and then your commitment to young people uh, in, in this uh, 100 Black Men of America. And you know, not only are you helping young Black men, but also all the fathers oh, yeah. and others older men who are seeing you doing these things and it's raising them up because if you say that I can be what I see right then that means that as they see their young people their their sons their grandsons uh, being mentored and nurtured they know that it's also hope for them so I just want to say thank you so much I appreciate you and to my audience remember you always have to be inspired you always have to be in order to be transformed. If you have inspiration and you don't have information, <laughs> hey, you cannot see transformation. So you gotta have both. See you next week. God bless.